Welcome to the Church Leaders Podcast, conversations with today's top ministry leaders to help you lead better every day. And now podcasting from scenic Colorado Springs, Colorado, here's your host, Jason Day. Hello, friends, and welcome to the Church Leaders Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Day, and this is a bonus episode that we have for you, wishing you a happy new year. And I am joined here in the studio by Megan Briggs, who is the churchleaders.com editor. And we are going to share with you in this bonus episode our top 10 most listened to interviews from the Church Leaders Podcast in 2018. So we're going to dive right in, and we hope that you enjoy these. If you haven't listened to all of these interviews that we talk about, you can find links to them in the show notes for this episode. So let's go ahead and dive right in. Hello, friends. We're so excited to have you with us on this, a sort of special episode of the Church Leaders Podcast, a little different than what we typically do as we're winding down the year. So I'm excited because I am joined here in the studio by Megan Briggs, who is the editor of churchleaders.com. So welcome, Megan. Thank you. It's great to be here on this, the other side of the podcast, it feels like. Yeah, awesome. I'm, I'm super excited because uh, a couple of things we're going to do on this episode is, what, or one of the big things we're going to do is we're going to recap um, a lot of what we've we've seen over this past year. And so that's why I've got Megan in here with us. She's the one who, um, all the stories that are going out on churchleaders.com, she helps uh, provide oversight for all of that. And so we just thought it'd be uh, really cool to just spend some time looking at, reflecting back on 2018 and uh, just talking a little bit about what we've experienced, what's encouraged us, um, some big stories. And of course, this is not going to be exhaustive. We can't go through every big story, but we're just going to touch on some that um, some of our readers, some of our listeners have really connected with and engaged with and uh, just some different stories. So super excited. But before we jump in, I want to say a huge thank you to all of our listeners. Obviously, the podcast wouldn't even exist if we didn't have all of you downloading and listening every single month. So, And we are thankful for the work you're doing for the kingdom. And that's one of the things I love about the podcast is our brothers and sisters, our colleagues in ministry, pastors, ministry leaders who are faithful leading day in, day out, every single week. Um, and, and we know what it's like to be in, in ministry. We know what it's like to, to serve as a pastor and to know the different expectations that are upon us, the highs and the lows, um, the great celebrations, uh, the challenging days as well. And so we appreciate you. We love you. We, we pray for you guys regularly. And just want to say, again, just a big thank you. And our prayer is that your holiday celebrations, if you're listening to this as we release it, that um, your Christmas celebrations and as you're preparing for the new year, we, we pray and hope that not only was it impactful for your, the community in which you serve and for your your church. But we pray that this will be a time of reflection for you and relaxation, time to be with friends and the family, and just kind of get renewed and re-energized for a new year of ministry. So again, we love you all and uh, thank you for being with us. I, I want to pray for you now and just kind of seek God on your behalf. And uh, it's just kind of a, a special thing I, I just love. And, and you guys may not know this, but every time before I jump on a podcast and, uh, you know, jump into a conversation with one of our guests, I take time to pray. And um, in, in that time of prayer, I'm praying for our conversation, but I'm praying for all of you as well as you'll be listening to those podcasts as they release. So I just want to take a moment and pray for, for you at this time. Father God, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for the the joy you bring into our lives through Christ Jesus. We thank you for the hope that you offer us. And Lord, we just think back across this year and think of all the different experiences that we've had as individuals, all the experiences we've had um, within our church communities, within our our towns, our neighborhoods, and our cities. And Lord, we thank you for this, this past year. Lord, I know that there are probably many who are listening who have gone through some challenging times, maybe some loss. And Lord, I just pray that you would minister to them, that you would extend your grace and your mercy to them, your compassion during these days. Lord, we know that there are also some great things that, that we've celebrated, 
people that we've been in conversation with, people we've been praying for for a long time who have come and have committed their lives to Jesus Christ, those who have been baptized, those new babies who have been born in our local congregations and, and just the life that we experience in that, God. And so, Lord, we thank you for all of those moments of joy and celebration as well. Lord, I pray now for our pastors and ministry leaders as they're listening in. I pray that you would just uh, give them encouragement, that you'd strengthen their hearts and their minds, that you would give them uh, a boldness and um, a courage to step into those things to which you are calling them. God, I pray that you would protect them, protect their families. Uh, Lord, I, I pray that you just draw them near to you, help them not to just get caught up in the you know, hectic life of ministry, but help them to find space and make space in their lives for their first love, for Christ Jesus, that they would really dig in. And may this new year be a year of renewal in their hearts, in their lives, in their families, in their churches, and in their ministries, Lord. We just love them. We pray for every man, for every woman who is serving uh, your kingdom. And we thank you that you invite us to come and be a part and participate in your mission. It's very humbling Uh, Lord, and we just want to be found faithful in that. So thank you for your great love for us. Thank you for Christ, for his life, for his death, for his resurrection, and the new life he offers us. We love you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, let's get into our recap of 2018. It's been an interesting year in many ways. And really, uh, to kind of start off, one of the things that uh, has been talked about literally all year long has been kind of an issue that the church has been facing and uh, not the best of news in some ways because it's difficult to, to process through this, but I think it's, um, it's, it's something healthy that's happening in the church as difficult mm-hmm. as it is. And that's kind of the, um, the church to movement. So Megan, what, what did we see early starting in the very beginning of 2018? Really? Right. Right. The very first week of 2018 was uh, when the whole story with Andy Savage broke and, you know, it really brought up a lot of questions of abuse that's happened, you know, decades ago. How, right. do, we, how do we handle that? I, I mean, some people were asking, like, is this even valid anymore? Yeah. You know, and like they were, we were asking that at the beginning of the year. And now like coming to the end of the year, it's almost like our mindset has changed so dramatically on that topic. And I think the reason is because there were just a lot of things that came out this year. So, you know, we had Andy Savage. We had, in March, the Chicago Tribune broke this big story about Bill Hybels and Willow Creek. That one just, I think, took a lot of people by surprise. And, you know, it was, it was one of these things. Um, it was a, an investigative journalist right. that really broke the story out to the public, um, which is something we saw recently, too, with the Independent Baptist Church movement. Uh, A big article just came out about them. And the whole thing just really struck me as, okay, you know, our our culture is really taking a step back and saying, we're not handling allegations of abuse correctly. We really need to, like, reconsider how we're handling these. And I think that it's caused a lot of churches, a lot of denominations to consider their ways and think about, you know, how do we respond to allegations? How do we respond to victims? Um, how do we handle pr- predators right. and, and you know, people who are in the wrong? Even if those people are our top leaders, like, how do we handle this? And I think that, you know, in the future, as time goes on, it's just going to be more and more obvious that if, if a church or a denomination doesn't do that work themselves, someone else will do it for them. Yeah, it's a good point because of the, like you said, the investigative journalists who have been kind of breaking some of these stories. Right. And and it's interesting because as we kind of reflect on the, the year, like you said, so much has happened in this particular arena. And it's interesting how we've seen different churches and denominations respond. And it feels in many ways, at least from my perspective, that as the year has gone on, that churches and ministry leaders have been responding more quickly and, and kind of more transparently. Mm-hmm. You know, it's almost like mm-hmm. there's this revelation that has 
you know, finally kind of come across over the last year that, hey, these are serious issues. This is something that historically probably hasn't been addressed out in the open. We know, I mean, as, as stories unfold, and we think of, of not only um, Protestant evangelical churches, but of course, mm-hmm. uh, you know, this has been something we've been facing uh, with the Roman Catholic Church now for quite some time, and even right. more stories have broken around the Roman Catholic Church. So this is right. something that that we as a church, I think, are not just recognizing, but it's this idea that we cannot kind of dismiss it. We cannot try to take care of it in, in ways that, you internally. know, internally, exactly, in ways that, you know, it's not going to get out or it's not going to be as a big thing because this is just the, the reality, right? So it's just it's just fascinating to see the progress in one year. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think we're moving in a positive direction, right? Don't you? Absolutely. I mean, overall, right. And this is, this is obviously something much needed. And the way that, um, the way people are handling it, I think, is getting healthier and healthier, which is a good thing because that's good for the survivors, you know, those who have been abused. It's good for the health of the church as a whole, for us to be a confessing church, right? Mm-hmm. And and we can help set an example to the world at large as to what it looks like whenever there is failure and what that looks like uh, as people of God and how do we handle that? And I think that's been one of the biggest questions from outside the church looking in is, wait a second, you're supposed to be the people who are honoring God. And yet it seems like in many cases, there's been a lot of cover up maybe, or just kind of dismissive, dismissive attitudes or kind of ignoring certain things. But this is our opportunity to, to demonstrate what what it really looks like to be the people of God, right? Right. I think um, switching gears here, st- switching to streams of the church, um, the SBC, you know, J.D. Greer, who is now the president of the SBC, had, I think he's summarized it pretty well. He um, posted a, a video to his Facebook page in which he said, we're going through a reckoning. Like this, he called it a reckoning. And, you know, he was kind of responding um, to the whole thing that happened with Paige Patterson that broke in May and just the idea of Paige Patterson wasn't, wasn't accused of committing sexual assault himself, but he was accused of silencing someone who disclosed abuse. Mm. And so it's, it's almost like, I mean, a lot of people are implicated like, you know, in this, in this wide net that's been cast. And I really appreciated what JD Greer said. Um, you know, his perspective was, look, Scripture tells us that judgment comes to the house of the Lord first. And so we, sh- we really shouldn't be surprised, honestly, um, that we're that God is kind of shaking us right now. And I think that's a great perspective. You know, yeah, we're being shaken. And that can only be good for us in the long run. It can only be good for us to kind of get our house in order and move forward. Because if we are if we are claiming to be the ones who tell the truth. Right. We need to tell the truth, right, right, even when it comes to sexual abuse. So I think that was really helpful in this conversation. I think another thing that was helpful was your interview um, with Craig Rochelle, and he actually spoke, he opened up the Global Leadership Summit. He had the daunting task of kind of opening up that that conference right after this whole thing broke with Bill Hybels. and you know, some of the things that he mentioned in, in your interview with him, I thought were were really helpful for this conversation as well. Um, you know, things about just the very way he just kind of addressed the the issue that we're all talking, we're all thinking about, you know, and, and he said, the, basically, the worst thing you can do is not to say anything. Exactly. Yeah. I, I loved, I, that was a great conversation that Craig and I had, if you haven't listened to it, uh, to that particular episode, make sure you do. We'll have it in the show notes. But yeah, one of the things that uh, for those of you who were at Global Leadership Summit or, you know, watched it from, you know, a host site or whatever, I I was just, when I was there, I was just kind of really curious as to how Craig was going to handle it because Craig basically stepped in and, and he did what Bill has done every single year. You know, mm-hmm. and he, so he kind of stepped in there in hosting it and hosting it. Yeah. And kind of opening it up and then even closing it down. And whenever he did that, I was, you know, so 
uh, lots of emotions. I think I, w- I was I was pleased and relieved and so appreciated how he handled it because he did not avoid, you know, the the topic. Like he addressed it head on. Mm-hmm. Um, he shared he shared with me in, in that conversation that he, whenever they came and asked him if he'd be willing to to do this, he said he he would only do it if he first could s- speak with the people who had been abused, you know, and, and talk mm-hmm. with them and their families and, and really get a oh, understanding. You know, he wasn't going to just step in something where, you know, it's just kind of hearsay and, and, and whatever, and just kind of play a role. He wanted to, I mean, he's a pastor, right? So he right. wanted to be the pastor in that moment. And man, the way that he addressed it, the way that he, it, it was just, it was just a per- perfect example in so many ways, I think of, of how we as the church can learn to address these things that are often incredibly uncomfortable to address, mm-hmm. right? And just the sense of of um, pastoring with integrity is one of the things that we, we talked about and mm-hmm. leading with integrity and what does that mean? And um, so, yeah, I think that was, that, that, was, that was really powerful and something that we all, I think, can learn from because this really isn't going away. Um, you know, it's been throughout 2018, more than likely. It's going to continue in 2019. Um, they're... they're New things that are that are breaking or being confessed mm-hmm. um, all the time, and you know this is like you said, uh, you know, in quoting J.D. Greer, you know, this is kind of the reckoning. This is this is an opportunity for us to be responsible as the church, right? With with some of some of our past that that uh, was harmful, and this is our opportunity to to honor God in the midst of it all, right? Right, and I think you know, I I I. Honestly, I don't envy pastors their job right now. Like it's very yeah. difficult. You know, how do you how do you lead in this church two era? That's a huge question on everyone's minds. Um, and I think, um, again, from your interview with Craig Rochelle, I think one of the really encouraging things that he said is we have to keep in mind that the majority of pastors are good people that are trying to help people. Exactly. You know, they they love they fear God. They're they they love other people. They're trying to help. And honestly, I think we're all just kind of sitting here going, what do we do? You know, God, what do you want us to do? How do we respond to this? What's what's the right response here? And I think that's, I've, I'm encouraged because I think that's what we're doing. I think we are like taking the time necessary to kind of step back, asking experts, you know, what we should be doing. And I, I really, I feel like your average local church they're doing that, and and well, I'm and I'm thankful for that. Yeah, without a doubt, and it, and and that's the thing in situations like this, and you know, especially with some high profile leaders in the church this year. You know, it's one of those things where uh, those are things that attract uh, attention. Those are things that attract the media. Those are things that you know. But like you said, week in week out, so many pastors, just like those of you who are listening in right now, you're you're doing all you can to honor God. You're being faithful. You're loving the community God's put you in and the people that he's entrusted to you. And uh, we, we want to make sure that we celebrate that and don't right. let, you know, some of some of these other, you know, negative stories overshadow the great things that are happening in local churches all over the country, all over the world, and lives that are coming to Christ, lives that are being transformed, mm-hmm. you know, the hope that's being presented, the communities that are being transformed because of the faithfulness of pastors like you. So, yeah. Agreed. All right, shifting gears a bit now. Let's talk about some of the some disagreements that kind of came up and, and were kind of publicized uh, around maybe some interpretations of scripture or theology. I'd say one of the big um, theological debates of the year centered around social justice. Yeah. So um, John MacArthur and a number of his um, compatriots. Um, released the statement on social justice in the gospel. And um, if you didn't read about that, we've got some really good articles recapping that whole debate on church leaders. But essentially it kind of, it had the, the, the statement had the potential to kind of pit people in two camps, um, whether you were, you know, saw the merits of social justice and, and, and felt like that was part of our calling as the church and whether you felt like the whole social justice movement is taking away from the mission of the church, which was kind of John MacArthur's stand on that topic. Right. And so so the, the statement actually, and this is what a lot of the pushback was, 
it became a very, very divisive statement, right? Mm -hmm. um, and like you said, it was kind of drawing a line. And so the people are, who are saying, wait, the, the gospel is often expressed through social justice, like social justice is part of gospel. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they can't be separated. They were kind of put in a position where, you know, they were told, no, you know, that like, the, you know, you're either going to be gospel for gospel or for social justice. Right. And so that was the big like thing that a lot of people were kind of scratching their heads over. Like, wait, it's it's not either or. There's definitely a both and here. Right. Right. And so we saw people like um, Al Mohler, you know, releasing um, not really. He did a um, he did a message at like a chapel service. Um, at Southern Seminary talking about it and he kind of did a good job breaking down John MacArthur's viewpoint and then kind of giving his own interpretation of scripture and also just how the church should be engaged in social justice issues. I think a lot of it, a lot of the debate is really an issue of how you define things. <laughs> right. So I think a lot of it was about like Maybe people saying the same things but using different wording. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm not going to say the whole thing is about that because that's obviously not accurate. But I think some of it was a little bit of the Twitter war that went on was a lot of people just not listening to each other and understanding each other. We had a couple um, guests on the on the podcast that I think did a good job addressing, you know, social justice initiatives. Um, one of them was uh, Brian Loritz. Yeah. And, um, you know, he, the thing that I really appreciated about his interview was um, he was talking about privilege and, you know, addressing quote unquote white privilege, which, you know, some people would, would take an issue with that phrase. But what he was saying is, you know, it's not so much that the white culture has privilege and that's the problem as much as it's the poor stewardship of that privilege that is causing a problem. Yeah, that was solid. I love that interview. Yeah, that was honestly one of my favorite ones. And and one that really, I think, um, spoke to the issue in a very like compassionate and understanding way. Definitely, yep. Um, so I'd say if you haven't listened to that one, definitely go back and check that one out. Another social, kind of social justice um, I'm thinking about interviews that we had is when we in had an interview with Gavin Rogers, mm -hmm. who uh, was a pastor who went down literally and um, traveled um, with the migrant caravan that was making its way through Mexico. Mm -hmm. and, th and that was a, a, a recent um, a recent interview. And there was an article, uh, article on church. And that was one of the most. Yeah. That was engaged articles, wasn't it? Of the year, really, wasn't it? That was that was our, our most viewed article of the year. Um, we did a I I just happened to see his um, his posts about joining the caravan. Um, I think I saw them on on like Twitter or something, right? And um, so we you know wrote a story around it from the information we gathered from like his social media page, and it just the article did really well. Like there were so many people looking at that. And so we were able to do an interview with him on the podcast and he kind of explained, you know, his reasoning for going down there. And a lot of it was, you know, we hear all these things on social media or on the news about, you know, the migrant caravan. And he honestly was just like, what's the, tr what's truth? Like what is actually happening? Right. Yeah. He wants to see it firsthand for himself. Right. And, and to, to have conversations with people who were in it not just talking about it, right. which really was his heart behind the whole thing. And he had no idea what he was going to experience, you know, at all. Yeah. Like he, when he went down there, he had no clue and, um, and it turned into a little adventure for him. Right. Right. And I, and I appreciated what he said. I thought he, um, really captured, um, an aspect of being a pastor. And that was, you know, he, he mentioned a couple of times, like I just, we just wanted to stand in solidarity with the migrants and we wanted to understand what was happening with them. And I, and I think that's a great picture of what a pastor does, you know, um, like standing in the gap with people right? and just trying to figure out like, how do I, how do I pray for you? How do I help you? What do you need? Um, I think that's a very like pastoral thing to do. And I thought he did a great job explaining. Definitely that. the whole idea of just being present, right? Right. Yeah. Being present, which is, is what we're called to do as pastors. So, so it's, 
great stuff. And then I had a great conversation with Andy, Andy Stanley, which was super fun. But Andy, and I love Andy to death. He's one of the most gracious people. If you've ever met him, he's one of the most, seriously, most gracious people. And it's funny because he tends, and, he, and he's knows this about himself, he tends to, to say things that end up causing controversy. Mm-hmm. That's, that's one of his spiritual gifts, I think he told me once. But anyway, um, so he, you know, he was uh, on different media, you know, aside from our podcast, obviously had a, had a new book released. And so there was a kerfuffle around um, some statements he made about the Old Testament. And some people were coming out really hard at me, like, oh, my goodness, Andy, once again, you know, here he's, like, trying to say, ah, we could just toss the Old Testament and don't even have to worry about it. And if wherever you have fallen on this, you know, if you care about this at all, again, I would encourage you to go listen to my conversation with Andy um, on on the podcast because – and I've pointed so many people to that conversation um, who – you know, are making statements on social media who haven't read the book or haven't talked with Andy and they're just going off of things that they've heard or just snippets. That's what happens so often with with so many people, not just Andy, but so many people. You know, people take a a snippet of something you say and they turn it into to much more. You know, they they treat the commentary around it Mm -hmm. and uh, and yet they've pulled it maybe out of context or just, you know, don't know the full story. So uh, definitely it was a great interview. And uh, he makes things very, very, very clear in that interview, I think, as to his understandings and, and, and his heart and his intentions. So that was just another interesting thing, which we always, you know, every year you have a, a few of these things kind of pop up. Right. Which you got to have that one controversial interview. Exactly. Oh, yeah. Exactly. There you go. <laughs> this year also we, we lost we lost many leaders in, in the church. But for us here in, in the U.S., and, and and both of uh, these gentlemen I'm going to mention have obviously have had international impact, but you know two really stand out that that we lost this year, and that's Billy Graham and Eugene Peterson, mm-hmm. and um, uh, two godly men who, by their own mission, didn't always get it right. None of us do, but really sought to honor God with their lives and to to share His uh, you know the love and the hope of Christ with as many people as they possibly could, and. Um, um, so those are obviously two big stories. My uh, with Eugene, I had the opportunity to interview him, and uh, w- one of my favorite interviews of all time um, was my conversation with Eugene Peterson. It's kind of funny because his publicist said, "You know, Eugene, he's he's busy, he's older, he's trying to wind down. So you know, you know, maybe you know, just keep it tight. You know, maybe you get twenty five, thirty minutes to have a conversation with him, type of thing." And and so I, I was just excited to to have that, right? You know. And Eugene and I probably talked for over two hours, and uh, which was just amazing. Like so, so we had the you know the interview that uh, you know on the podcast that was released on the podcast. And again, if you haven't listened to it, go check it out. We'll have it in the show notes. But so we had that. But then, oh, he was just such a joy. He just you know just continued to talk to me like a brother. It was super cute too because at one point he was like, Jason, there's a guy coming to the house. He was in his home up in Montana there on on the lake, and he said. Um, our furnace has gone out and the furnace repair man is, is coming. Is that okay? And I'm like, yeah, sure. He's like, I'm so sorry. I didn't think about, you know, scheduling this differently. So literally in the middle of our conversation, he's like, Hey Jason, uh, the first repair man's here. Can you give me a second? And I'm like, sure. So, so he went and, you know, talked to the, the repairman. It's just so, he's just that type of, uh, of a guy, just so genuine, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Just like, uh, and it was just such, such a blessing and the work that he has done, you know, the, the volumes that he has written, you know, and he's, he's a pastor, you know I mean? That his, his pastor's heart is just so clear, so evident. So that was, that was very special. And, uh, you know, it's a great loss to the church, but his legacy lives on just like Billy Graham's does. And so it's a beautiful thing. Some good things though, some encouraging things happening in the church world. So Megan, what, what are some of the, some of the, you know, encouraging stories, some of the, some of the exciting things that we've seen? Um, one of the things that really encouraged me this year was um, when the fires happened in California, um, there were a few stories we did about just churches being the church, Yeah. Um, helping people, you know, providing shelter. There was actually one story we did uh, about a ministry that uses service dogs. Mm-hmm. And um, they went out to California originally for um, because of the shooting. And they were they were supposed to go home right after that, but then the fires broke out, 
And so they actually stayed in California with their dogs and continued to minister to people. And it just, I'd never heard of a ministry like that before, wow, but yeah. it just seemed like such a great work. You know, sometimes it's, it's hard to talk to another person, but, um, God in his wisdom gave us dogs, I feel like. So there you go. Yeah. So they really, um, they really seem to help people. You know, what's, what's so awesome. And, and this is one of the things, again, kind of go back, goes back to, to something we, we touched on earlier was oftentimes the issues, the controversies, the negative stories, you know, are the ones that uh, people latch on to, Right. Mm-hmm. And, and yet there are churches all over the world that are faithfully being the church week in and week out and transforming their communities and uh, sharing the hope of Christ and serving. And literally there's story after story after story after story. And, and unfortunately those aren't the stories that get all of the eyeballs or, you know, or all of the publicity, but God is at work and faithful pastors and ministry leaders, like those of you who listen in, um, we so appreciate what you're doing. One of my, my kind of favorite stories, I interviewed a gentleman by the name of John Sanders. And um, John is one of those guys, he, you know, he doesn't have big books published, you know, he doesn't speak at a ben- bunch of conferences and those types of things. He's not a household name, right? Mm-hmm. Um, that's one thing I, things I love about the Church Leaders Podcast is we get to talk to, you know, some uh, men and women in the church world that, you know, everyone kind of knows, Christine Kane, Francis, you know, we get to talk to them, but then we also get to talk to some of the, some of these uh, pastors and ministry leaders who are just doing kingdom stuff that, you know, we just hear, we come across a tweet or we hear a story or have a conversation with someone and we're like, man, let's dig into that. And so we, we track them down and, and have a conversation. And, and so John, what I loved about John is John came out of seminary, studied for ministry, came out of seminary. Um, in his denomination, he was assigned to a a small rural church in the Dakotas, you know, very small town. And when he went there, it's a, you know, fired up, you know, young preacher, pastor, fresh out of seminary. He's like, yeah, I'm going to go in there and I'll be there for maybe a year or two. And then I'll get to uh, be moved to a larger city and a kind of a real church and kind of, you know, that sort of, you know, which I think a, a lot of us in ministry, you know, that's kind of the mentality, you know, sometimes. Mm-hmm. And man, God did something awesome in his life in that little rural church and the impact that he has has had. And he's stayed there now, I think, over a decade, right? And the impact he's had not only on his community, but then reaching out to other rural communities and actually doing multi-site in small rural communities um, and uh, planting churches and all like God just opened his eyes to this whole opportunity. And, and those stories are so awesome. I love to celebrate, to hear those stories, to celebrate those stories, because there's so many pastors just like John that are out there that are, again, serving God faithfully, you know, on mission and doing significant things. So it's just, that was, that was one, just, I remember one conversation, one story that just really encouraged me over this past year. Yeah. And actually, while you were talking about that, I was thinking of another interview um, you did with a gentleman, um, Corey Nelson. Oh yeah. And that is probably one of my top all time favorite interviews because he's just a, you know, local pastor from Kentucky. Yeah. Louisville area. Yeah. Yeah. And a really difficult Right. Low income, high crime area in, in the Louisville. Louisville. Yeah. yeah. And I, I loved his interview because he just talked about how, you know, he, he was assigned to this really like struggling, kind of a dying church. Yes. Uh-huh. And, um, you know, they tried to do the typical church programs that you do and, and those were doing okay. And they were trying to reach out to like drug addicts and, you know, kind of people on the street, homeless people, like that kind of thing. And they were doing okay, but every time they... He said, every time we opened our doors, we just had kids like climbing all over us and they, they were, the church was overrun by children. Yeah. I love it. He said like they would do recovery, yeah, celebrate you know, recovery. celebrate recovery, you know, these addiction ministries. And so they'd open the doors and all these kids would come in cause they just wanted to be, you know, in community. Yeah. And, and it's not that they were suffering from alcoholism or, or whatever it is, or some drug addiction. It's just the church doors were open and they were craving a place to belong. Right. right. They didn't really have anywhere else to go. Right. Right. And so, um, long story short, he kind of turned his church into, as far as he knows, the very first church for children and yeah. a church exclusively dedicated to children. And it was just such a cool thing to hear his story and to hear how, 
over the course of some time, it, it took a lot of nudges, but, you know, eventually he was like, oh, I think God is calling me to do this. And meanwhile, he's like, he said, you know, it was like I'd pray about what to do and what God wanted me to do. And it felt like I was always trying to like get kids off of me. Like they were just like <laughs> always around him. And yeah, that, that, that was just hands down one of my favorite stories this year. All right. So 2018 was a very eventful year for the church. And um, lots of of highlights there, just kind of recapping it. And Megan, thank you for being here with us to help us kind of walk through that. Certainly appreciate you being here in the studio. Thank you so much for having me. Excellent, sister. All righty. Well, pastors, we love you. Ministry leaders praying for you. God bless you all and have a happy new year. I appreciate you taking the time to be with us on this week's episode. Every week as we are putting the episodes together, we're thinking of you, our pastors and ministry leaders, and striving to provide insightful and inspiring interviews as you seek to grow as a kingdom leader. So we hope you're finding value from the Church Leaders Podcast. And if so, we'd certainly appreciate you taking a few moments to head over to iTunes and leave us a review. Your positive reviews and ratings help other church leaders more easily find our podcasts so they too can benefit from these interviews. Again, we thank you in advance, and if you have any comments, any questions, suggestions, or ideas for guests, I would love to hear from you. You can send me an email to podcast at churchleaders.com, or you can connect with me on Twitter. Finally, you can find this podcast as well as other great faith-based podcasts on the Faith Play app. It's available for both Apple and Android, and so we encourage you to check that out as well. So until next time, this is Jason Day encouraging you to love well, and lead well. You've been listening to the Church Leaders Podcast. For articles, videos, and free resources that will help you lead better every day, visit our website at churchleaders.com. Thanks for listening.